This morning we're going to reflect specifically on the teaching of Paul that the law of, of God is important, but it only goes so far. Grace takes over from there. What is unique about grace? That's what we're specifically reflecting on it. And how does that relate to Lent? If you've ever wondered about the juxtapositioning between the law and, say, faith, this morning will be a, a, a good reflection, a time for you to think a little deeper about that. We have begun a sermon series on the letters of Paul, and the reason why that topic is what we're reflecting on is because in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, the, the book of Galatians, that is the topic that is most reflected upon. That, that is the point that Paul is speaking into in regard to his hearers, and, um, and for good reason, because there were, there were those who were coming to the church at Galatia after Paul had taken um, probably two missionary journeys there, definitely one, likely two, and after Paul had uh, made Christians out of Gentiles, there were some from the Jewish faith that were coming to try to not make, not make Christians out of Gentiles, but to, to sort of wean people off of Paul's ideology. And so, and so we're, we're influencing them to take more of their faith observance from, from the law. And so Paul was speaking into that. And because of that, if you've ever read Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, you will notice as you compare it to his other letters that from the beginning, his tone is different. Most of the letters uh, that Paul writes to his churches, there's this sort of pattern. He starts off with a greeting, talking about you know, who it is from, you know, and then some sort of praise that he's giving to what's going on at the church, very thankful about this and that, and then some sort of prayer for them. Usually lasts about almost all of the first chapter, but usually about 10 verses. If you read the letter to the Galatians, it's nothing like that. It, it, within, I'd say, five verses, his tone changes from, from edifying, from excited about what's going on there, to sharp. Uh, I would even say uh, harsh. I would even say, if you want to get more specific, uh, acerbic. He was not happy with things that were going on there. Very different. He would name in this letter and others those who were trying to undo what he had done as, as Judaizers. These were folks that um, were claiming to be followers of Jesus but we're influencing folks to be a little more uh, legalistic rather than leaning into faith in Jesus. And, and the, the one real hot topic uh, in regard to being legalistic was going back to the need for circumcision to prove or fulfill one's faith. But it wasn't just that. It was um, observing the feasts and the fest festivals and the rituals. And we won't, we won't stay into this sort of history lesson too long, but it, it's important to know to understand why Paul was making such um, a heated argument about uh, the prioritization of faith in the grace of God rather than following and adhering to the, the law of God. So Galatia would be a, a Roman colony, mostly Gentiles, so it was important for Paul that they understand that they don't have to fulfill uh, a lot of the, the laws of the Old Testament, but there was a, a New Testament that Christ had fulfilled, and Paul was inviting them into that. Salvation, as was offered to the Jewish people for centuries to be the light of the world, had now, through Jesus, been made universal. And, and Paul wanted to make sure that, that that idea did not get lost. Martin Luther, who, who would be the father of the Protestant Reformation, would say that, that the letter to uh, 
the Galatians, was the charter of the Reformation. It, it was Martin Luther's favorite letter, and specifically because of this idea. This is where we get the phrase um, um, uh, justification by faith alone, sola, sola fide. So it appears, this idea of faith appears over 20 times, and you hear language about the law upwards up to about 30 times, and each time, this is throughout the letters, chapters one, chapter 1 through 6, each time they're sort of pitted against one another. Um, chapters 1 through 2 is Paul arguing for his, uh, his personal apostleship. Just because you have Judaizers coming to you, you don't, you don't need to take their word over mine. He speaks of his calling being from God, not from man. From man. Uh, in chapters 3 through 4, he speaks of the doctrine, we'll say, of justification by faith. That is, that is salvation and all the benefits of grace. That is unmerited favor coming to us because of our faith. And then in 5 through 6, this is just an outline of the book. 5 through 6, you get you get some ideas on practice, how to, how to live out what he's talking about. So what I wanted to get into uh, was a sort of uh, lesson on the point of the law as he spells it out. Because if you read the letter, you'll hear this. And um, if, if, if you don't know, uh, if you haven't sat with the letter long enough, you might not hear it. So I want to give you what he's trying to say in my own sort of language. Um, so... To begin with, let me, let me go ahead and read a verse of scripture. Chapter 3, verse 24. This is the one verse I want to focus on. He says concisely in one line, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The law, the point of the law was to lead us to Christ. And here's how. Okay. So I've drawn something up. And uh, if you don't get it immediately, uh, eventually maybe it'll seep in. Okay. So when I, in, my, in my first uh, work life, I was electronics technician in the Navy. And one of the things we did was we would measure radio frequencies. And when you would see a radio frequency, it would be in the form of a wave. And sometimes you would want to modulate that frequency to be more or less. Okay, so that's where this initial idea is coming from. Don't lose me. This is not hard, I promise. If I can understand it, you can understand it. Okay, the main image on this um, illustration is a wave. Okay, you see the black wave? Okay, running through. That is, let's say, the broadband of our human experience. That is, that is what we are capable of as human beings, all right? And we can't on our own modulate the frequency of it. We, we sort of are who we are, so to speak, right? So the law was given, the law is the red line running through the wave. Do you see that? The law was given to show that's, that area is the part of, of the frequency of humanity that God is cool with, right? That's the part of us that, that, that God's like, yes. Okay, that part, you're loving yourself in a way that is godly. You're loving other people in a way that is godly. You're loving me back in a way that is godly. All that's good. I'm, I'm digging that. Uh, but, but the stuff that's going outside of the band that I'm looking for, yeah, that, those are, well, let's call those the darnets, all right? That's the stuff, that's the stuff we, um, we don't do even though we know we should do, and, and we may not talk about it with other people, but in our own self-talk, we're like, darn it, I really ought to, and I just really don't feel like it. So we'll, that's the lower darnet. The higher darnet is stuff that, uh, that we do do, we do do, that we are doing, no, it's doo-doo, that we, that, that we do-do in our life that we know we shouldn't do-do, and, and we just continue to do it. 
Uh, and, and every time we do it, we're like, darn it. I, I knew it. I, knew, I mean, I did it again. There I go again. And we've tried for years to get rid of that, and we just can't. So the law was dropped to show us the part of, of the uh, broadband of humanity that we really need to do something about. Okay, so over time, we've noticed it. Well, um, do I, is that it? Yeah. And so Jesus came to do something about the, the stuff that happens outside of the broadband, all right? The law was given to us also, Paul would say, not only to point, point out where it is we need to grow, but the law was given, he would say, um, a, as a parent or, or in another passage in the same chapter, as a tutor, to hold a place, to teach us. And so when you hear Paul saying, please don't go back to the law, it's as if he's saying to his listeners, don't go back to the place where you needed a tutor. Don't go back to the place where you needed a babysitter. Don't go, don't go back to the place where you needed a fence around the yard that you were going to play in. Okay, God, is, God has taken you out of the, rather than needing a fence in a yard that's not going anywhere, God has given you more of an umbrella to walk with him. And you know that you are going somewhere. Don't go back. So it'd be kind of like someone saying to you, you know, wh wh why are you driving to church in a, in a child's car seat? You know, you needed that when you were young. You really don't need that anymore. I know, but I'm just, I'm so familiar with it. Uh, wh why are you eating your lunch in a high chair? You really don't need that. Oh, I know, but I mean, I got a better view and I like it. It's better. Why, why are you still sleeping with a nightlight? Why are you still walking around with your blankie? Why, why do you need the passy? Can you pull at it? Because I can't understand a word you're saying. That's what Paul is saying. Why, why do you want to go back to this place where you needed a tutor to get you through that when Jesus is wanting to take you somewhere else? The, the implications for Lent are this. If we try to do Lent on our own, which is what the law was, which is, which is the weakness of the law. If you try to get rid of the, the highs and lows that the law does not, that the law encourages us are not helpful. If you try to do that on your own, you're going to continually fail. However, grace being as it is, unmerited favor, Jesus assists, in, assists us and that empowers us in that. And so as you're thinking about your Lenten observance, I would like to encourage you, ra rather than thinking about the things you're not supposed to do, which, which is important, be more inspired about what Jesus is going to do through your Lenten observance, and that will help you get rid of those spaces, if you hear what I'm saying. Okay, so as, as Jesus was in, was in ministry, he began to fulfill what the prophets who were around during the law would see. The prophets such as Ezekiel would see that the law is not going to get humanity to where they need to be. They're going to need something more. They're going to need the spirit of God, which is going to come through faith. Ezekiel would see this. Go home and read it. Chapter 36, somewhere around verse 27. Ezekiel would see a vision of a valley of dry bones but God's spirit would inhabit the dry bones. The vision being this, the dry bones are, are the law on its own. It's not very lively. Um, it's, not, it's not wonderful to look at. But with the spirit, you become animated and doing things that you would have never been able to do without God's spirit. That's what Ezekiel is seeing. And this is what happened when Jesus came. For instance, Jesus would come and in Mark 5, there was a woman who had tried to change something about her life for years. This was a space of darn it for her, and she couldn't do anything about it. Uh, the, she and the law alone could do nothing, but she had heard that Jesus was touching people, and faith in Jesus was making things happen in a way that humanity could not. She had heard he had healed a crippled man. She had heard that he had opened the, the eyes of a blind man. She had heard that he had cured someone with leprosy. So this woman, read Mark 5, it's a good story, who had an issue of bleeding, all of a sudden she, 
she kind of became alive on the inside with this hopeful expectancy of what could happen with, with exposure to Jesus. She began to have faith in what Jesus could do, trusting in the grace that could be offered her. Okay, this is, this is New Testament theology. It's not just you and the law. It is your faith animating your life and the blessing that comes from the grace that you receive. So here's what happens. Um, as she made her way to Jesus, there was some resistance, I'm sure, as there will be for you. There was a crowd. She had to get through it. I'm sure the crowd was thinking, what in the world is this woman doing? But when she got to Jesus, this is so interesting. Jesus noticed that someone had, had touched him. And so he asked the disciples, who was that? Who was that touched me? Well, to them, they were like, this is ridiculous. There's, there's hundreds of people thronging about you. You know, it could have been anyone. But Jesus was like, no, 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 this was different. There are hundreds of people around me, yes. But they are just haphazardly bumping into me. This person reached out with some sort of hopeful expectancy, as if she believed I could do something. Of course, he doesn't say all this, but he's saying, no, there is something different about this person. She reached out and touched me. She didn't just brush me. So as you go through this Lenten season, are we just, are we just sort of bumping into Jesus? Are we being tempted to go back into handling everything we're fasting for on our own? Or are we looking to Jesus with some hopeful expectancy? It makes a difference. Don't go back to the high chair. Don't go back to being uh, a bond servant, Paul would say in this letter. You are an heir to the kingdom. Everything that God has is available to you and his resources are not scarce. They are abundant. Another illustration uh, that, that Paul would show in Acts 14, verse 9, he would be teaching, and there would be a crowd of people, just like there was a crowd of people with this woman, and uh, he would notice, Acts 14, 9, go home and read it, he would notice that as he was teaching, one specific person had a different look in their eye, as if in regard to the teaching, this person was expecting something. This person was believing what Paul was saying, and so Paul would stop and would say, okay, you're ready. You're ready to receive something. It was this man's faith, faith that opened him up to this unmerited favor that was being offered. So receive that. In your talking about what you're doing, in your looking for what you're going to receive through this Lenten season, in your believing, do it in a way as if you are expecting. Something is going to happen. It's not just you and your fast and what you can accomplish. It's not just knocking off a couple inches from your waist because you cut out carbs. If you can manage that, great. I hope it works good for you. But, but aim what you're doing at, with some hopeful expectation about an issue in your life that you know that only God can take care of. Some breakthrough that you've been wanting either for yourself or for someone else in your life. It could be vocation related. It could be relationship related. Uh, it, it could be their own attitude about their life. Some breakthrough or uh, some stronghold in your life, something that's holding on to you and you can't seem to get away from its clutches. You can aim your fast at it. Do it with hopeful expectation about what Jesus can do and see what happens. It might not be a stronghold in your life. It could be something you know. You're like, oh, God, I just can't seem to get away from this. But it may be in someone else's life. They don't see the stronghold, but everyone else in their life sees the stronghold. Aim your fast with hopeful expectation, faith in the grace of, of God that he can do something about it and see what happens. Okay, well, 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 what if I do that? What if I'm like this lady 
and, and I'm not just relying on the law, but I, be, I decide to believe, and, and I make my way through the crowd just like her, and I look like an idiot just like her, and I get to Jesus, and I reach out. I'm not just, I'm not just waiting on Jesus to touch me, but I'm reaching out, trying to touch Jesus. I'm, I'm expecting, what happens if I do that and nothing happens? Okay, I understand the question. Well, hear me. First of all, what happens if you do that and something does happen? That would be kind of cool. Moreover, if you do that, if you approach these places in the broadband of your humanity that you can't seem to do anything about with hopeful expectation that God can do something about it, it's going to change your attitude for a little while. And how is that going to affect the people around you? They may say, well, that change in attitude was the miracle we all needed. Thank you very much. So even if something doesn't happen, you're going to bless the people around you. And more than likely, something will happen. So answer one of these questions sometime today before we go into communion. Number one, are you, in this Lenten season, just bumping into Jesus? Jesus is being offered. I know Jesus has been preached in your presence. I know Jesus has been talked about. Are you just bumping into Jesus? Or are you reaching out with some sort of hopeful expectancy? Or two, what unresolved darn it could you give to God in faith? What part of your humanity that is outside the law that you know is not good for you or for anyone else and you've worked on it between you and the law, you've worked on it all your life and you can't seem to do anything about it or someone else in your life, they've worked on something and they can't do anything about it. What on unresolved darn it could you give to God in faith with hopeful expectation? So Christ would, Christ would exceed the offering of the law by offering himself to us. He would, he would let his life be broken. On the night in which Christ died for you and for me, he took bread and he passed it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. For you. There's, this is a gift for you. This is not something that you're going to have to do on your own. I am giving you something. And, and the meaning of it is going to be revealed in a few days. I'm not just going to die. I'm not just going to be a broken body I mean, talk about an end of a story. The gospel would not have gotten out of the first century if it was just a broken body. But he rose from the dead. There is, there is, there is power from heaven in this gift that Christ has given us. And after giving thanks for the bread, he took the cup and passing it to his disciples, he said to each of them, now drink from this all of you. For this is the blood of a new covenant which has been poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of you, O Lord, and your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves today as a living thanksgiving as we proclaim the mystery of faith that, that Christ has died, but Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. God, we pray as we continue to walk in this season of Lent, that we don't go back to just doing it on our own, doing life without a hopeful expectation of what you might could do through us. But we pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk in faith. Help us to not just fast from things. Help us to fast for something. Help us to, help us to believe that as we reach out to you, that, that far more could happen than, than if we just did it on our own. God, we believe. So be present with us today as we receive you like that. As we come forward, Lord, and receive the body and blood, we don't want to just bump into you. We want to reach out with hope, hopeful expectation in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Um, Dee, would you mind coming forward and helping me uh, serve the elements?
So uh, it's an open table in the United Methodist Church. If you um, if you repent from your sin and seek to live in peace with one another, we invite you to receive. We do it through intinction. You will be given a piece of bread. You dip. If after receiving the piece of bread you don't dip, but go ahead and do this, just go ahead and eat it. Don't don't subsequently dip it after you put it in your mouth. You'll get another. There's plenty of Jesus to go around. So we invite you to come forward. Come to the center aisle, receive the elements, return, return through the outer aisles. Come forward.
there were any who were unable to come forward, um, we can serve you at your seat just by the raising of the hand. Help us to receive your unmerited favor. Help us not to, to return to doing it on our own strength. Help us to look with hopeful expectancy about, about what you can accomplish in our lives. As we have faith in the grace that, that you offered us, may we receive that this, this Lenten season as we prepare to observe a holy Easter. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Happy Sunday.